You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Johanna from Austria. And I'm Annie from the U.S. Thank you very much for joining us for another episode of Fresh Hell, the most international of true crime podcasts. And we're very glad you found us. This podcast is supported by our listeners through Patreon. Thank you very much for helping us to create better content for you. This week, we especially want to thank Jennifer Mead. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Beth W.S. Thanks, Beth. Jesse McCullough. Thanks, Jesse. And Jennifer White. Thank you very much. We are very grateful. Thank you so much. And if you out there would like info on how to become a patron, listen until the end. We'll tell you all about it. We also have a quick correction from two weeks ago, I think, to clarify a name, uh, the name Leininger, which for some reasons in our note kept autocorrecting to Leninger. But Leininger is the last name of the family who wrote the book Soul Survivor about their son James' past life memories as a pilot in World War II. That's right. Sorry about that. It happens with names. It's Names are hard. All right. So, Annie, you're going to tell us a story. What do you have for us today? Okay. So you may remember that last Halloween, I had looked into what the true story behind the Have You Checked the Children urban legend was. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's episode 82, if you're unfamiliar with that urban legend and that sort of creepypasta story. And so when I was looking for whatever true story had started the legend, this is another case that I came across, and it's terrifying. And unlike episode 82, where we talk about the Jenkins and Christman murders, Evelyn Hartley has never been found. Originally, I planned to wait until October to cover this again, but I honestly haven't been able to stop thinking about the case since I first read about it, so I'm hoping I'll just sort of get it out of my system by telling you all about it. So this is the story of the 1953 kidnapping and presumed murder of 15-year-old Evelyn Hartley. I don't know anything about it, so I'm very excited. Yeah, I didn't know anything about this either, and it's, well, you'll see, it just, it's really left me thinking about it. So I looked up some information on 1953, because it was, for sure, a more innocent time. How much is that doggy in the window was popular on the radio. That was a radio hit. That's one of those songs that I always think is like a song for children, but then you find out, oh no, that was a, that was a top of the charts hit. It's early 50s, so like Bobby Sox, the Korean War had just ended in 1953, Stalin died, Queen Elizabeth was coronated, I Love Lucy was on TV, the very first Chevy Corvette was built in Flint, Michigan. Shout out to the folks in Flint, Michigan, who have been going through absolute hell dealing with their water crisis. What else? Uh, Hugh Hefner published the first episode of Playboy, which had Marilyn Monroe as the centerfold. And Evelyn Hartley is a junior in high school, so it's her penultimate year of school in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Johanna, are you familiar with the game of La Crosse? Yes, but I just have a very basic knowledge, and uh, it's it's not huge here. It's actually rather niche, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So I could use a little refresher, please. Great, because I've got one for you. Okay. (laughs) I knew. (laughs) <laughs> I'm quoting ruleofsport.com on this because I'm not great with the sports ball. All right. So, quote, lacrosse is a team game in which a ball is passed between teammates using a stick with a mesh or net at one end. It originates in Native American communities where it was used as a training ground for tribal warriors and dates back almost a thousand years. You might remember a friendly game of lacrosse taking place in the film The Last of the Mohicans in which Daniel Day-Lewis stars, and in its early form, there were sometimes thousands of players on either side battling for victory. Since early versions of the game were witnessed and documented by French Jesuit missionaries, it gained popularity and was first codified in Canada in 1867. The modern game is a fast, frenetic contact sport that requires players to wear padding and helmets, a sight at which no doubt the Mohicans would have laughed heartily. End quote. I really liked that last (laughs) little bit. It's like when people who play rugby watch American football, and they're like, oh, it's charming. Look at the pads. A thousand players on each side. That's, wow. 
it used That's to something. be. Yeah, you can imagine what it used to be back in the day, especially as they used it for a training for battle. You know what I mean? It's yeah. yeah, it's definitely a sport that's gaining popularity. We actually played it in high school gym class. All I really remembering is cradling, which is like there was a lot of running around while the while the gym teacher, shout out Miss B, if you're listening, just yelled, "Cradle, cradle." cradle so which is like you spin the stick really quickly in your hands because the pocket is really shallow so you have to centrifugal force keeps the uh, ball in the pocket right i'm just bracing for now for the strongly worded letters from the lacrosse community i'm really sorry but it's popular here in new england and you'll find shops that only sell lacrosse equipment which always surprises people from other parts of the country or other parts of the world so there's some quick facts about the sport that gave the area its name and according to the lacrosse historical society they write that quote the ho-chunk ojibwe and sioux frequented the lacrosse area more than a thousand years before 19 year old nathan myrick arrived on november 8th 1841 myrick or Myrick was warmly greeted by the Ho-Chunk. He built a log cabin from which he hoped to launch a fur trading business. The city grew rapidly in its first decade. A post office was established in 1844, and a general store opened in 1846. By 1853, so a hundred years before our story happens, the town's population had grown to a whopping 543. On March 14, 1856, the village was legally incorporated as a city, and 50 years later, its massive Victorian city hall was constructed. During the second half of the 19th century, La Crosse became an important center for steamboats, lumber mills, railroads, and brewing. In 1884, La Crosse produced more beer than any other city in the state. At the turn of the 20th century, three colleges and universities were established in the city. End quote. And one of these was La Crosse State College. Today, it's part of the University of Wisconsin, and it's University of Wisconsin at La Crosse. Another interesting sidebar I found was that you can actually get a degree in language studies in the Ojibwe language at the University of Wisconsin, which is amazing. It's always really sad when you hear about languages dying out, and a lot of them are. Or dialects. Like, for example, yes. in Austria, a lot of dialect words are just vanishing. That's why I always try to, to use as many as I remember from during my childhood, because I think it's important to keep this alive. Absolutely. So working as professors at this college were two science and math professors, Mr. Vigo Rasmussen and Dr. Richard Hartley. Both worked, uh, as I said, teaching math and sciences, and it was nearing the end of October 1953, and the annual homecoming game was upon them. Should I explain what homecoming is, or do you think most people know homecoming? Look, as we are a true international podcast, the favorite international podcast of most people, <laughs> I think it's just fair to explain, because as far as I know, it just exists in the US. Yeah, right? I, I agree. It actually was interesting to me to look into it, because we didn't, we kind of had it at my school, but not really. So here's a little information from Wikipedia, which is my favorite source to quote when no one's life is on the line. <laughs> uh, so, quote, Homecoming is an annual tradition in the United States. People, towns, high schools, and colleges come together, usually late September or early October, to welcome back former members of the community. It's built around a central event, such as a banquet, dance, and most often, a game of American football, or, on occasion, basketball, ice hockey, or soccer. When celebrated by schools, the activities vary widely. However, they usually consist of a football game played on a school's home football field, activities for students and alumni, a parade featuring the school's choir, marching band, and sports teams, and the coronation of a homecoming queen, and at many schools, a homecoming king. A dance commonly follows the game or the day following the game. End quote. So, yeah, I can confirm the dance, and I'm willing to take Wikipedia's word on the rest of it. I know it's huge in some parts of the country. It's just not so much where I grew up. We didn't, there was no football. There is a football team now, but there was just a homecoming dance. And uh, that's all I remember. Is the dance like an elaborate prom? Homecoming was semi-formal. So all of my home, I have pictures. I can share pictures from homecoming. Do you guys want to see my homecoming pictures? Homecoming dresses were semi-formal. So like more like cocktail or tea length and prom would be okay. formal. Mm -hmm. Boys going to homecoming would usually wear a suit or a jacket and a tie with khakis, whereas prom is a tux. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. So everyone in town is looking forward to this homecoming game, and the Rasmussens had tickets to attend, but unfortunately for them, so did their usual babysitter. So 
They were going to be bringing their older daughter, who was six or seven at the time, but they also had a 20-month-old daughter named Janice, who would not be really old enough to enjoy these festivities. Fortunately, they were able to find another babysitter, the daughter of Professor Rasmussen's colleague and friend, a young woman by the name of Evelyn Grace Hartley. Evelyn was the third of four children, born to parents Richard and Ethel. She was born on November 21st, 1937. She had two older brothers and a younger sister. Unfortunately, her older brother, her oldest, their firstborn, Richard, had died of polio in 1946 while serving in the Navy. He was only 18 years old. Evelyn, who they either called her Evie or Evie, E-V-I-E, I'm going to say Evie, She was less than a month away from her 16th birthday. She was a really pretty girl, straight brown hair, bright blue eyes, gorgeous smile, and she was really popular with her teachers and her classmates. She was an honor roll straight A student who excelled in sciences. No surprise there, right? If you've got a biology professor as a father. Uh, She was also involved in the drama club, choir, boosters, and she played piano and was active in her church group. She had been on a few dates but had no serious boyfriend. I'm not sure whether she didn't have a boyfriend because she didn't want one or whether it might have been that her parents were on the stricter side. I think a lot of the information we have is, of course, from interviews given by her parents. You know, if if you had asked my mom and dad what I was like at 15, they would have said, oh, she's not interested in boys. She's focused on school. Like, of course I was interested in boys. I just wasn't allowed to date until I turned 16. My parents raised us like it was 1953. That's a Patreon episode. I have some funny stories. Anyway, I think it's possible she might have liked a boyfriend but wasn't allowed one yet. And I think it's also possible she might have preferred to go to the game net that night. But I think she was equally happy to earn some money babysitting. And it would be an easy job, just one young child who would be put to bed soon after she arrived. So she had brought several school books with her to get some studying done. And those were always... These are the best babysitting jobs. I always struggle a lot more if I have to be an authority figure. Like, I will yell at a child to drop the rock and step away from the wasp nest, but it's harder to be the bad guy, right? Which is why a Great Dane sleeps on top of me every night. I'm like Jennifer Coolidge's character in Best in Show. Like, I'm just here to provide unconditional love and decorative abilities. It's, (laughs) yeah. I don't know about children. I barely babysit when I was a teenager, but about dogs, I know. And I'm glad Philip is the bad guy. He's doing the bad guy part because I spoil them rotten. Mm-hmm. And then I always tell them, I'm going to tell dad, wait till he comes home. Then you're going to see what's happening. See, I do the same thing. I've literally had to text <laughs> Paul in the middle of the day and been like, I remember once with Tucker, he had rolled in something disgusting. And I was like, you need to come home and help me. I can't. It was like, your father's coming home. You're in so much trouble. We have. We don't have human children. We have to carry it on. So, on October 24th, 1953, the night of the homecoming game, Professor Rasmussen picked Evelyn up at her house, which was only about a mile away from her own home. And the Rasmussens lived in a brand new development. It was like a brand new subdivision, like a whole new neighborhood had just been built, right? And they lived in the 2400 block of, uh, I think it's pronounced Hoshler Drive. And Evelyn hadn't babysat for several months, but she was a smart girl who had plenty of experience. Per the norm with babysitting, she was given instructions, and they were to put the baby in bed at 7 o'clock, and then at 7.15 she should cover the baby with a blanket. The Rasmussens left for the game at about 6.45 p.m., and Evelyn had an understanding with her parents that she would call at 8.30 30 p.m. to check in with them. And again, this was part of her normal routine. Right, because you would call your parents to give them an update after the children were asleep because you probably didn't want them calling you, you know, the, not to wake up the baby after you finally got it to sleep. Exactly. Yeah. One thing that's mentioned often in the telling of this case is that Evelyn's mother had a very bad feeling not too long after her daughter left the house. And she really wanted to call because she just felt like something was wrong. But she said no, she felt like she was being silly, and she knew that Evelyn would call at 8.30. Evelyn did not call at 8.30. 
And so when the phone didn't ring, her parents phoned the Rasmussen house, but there was no answer. They probably didn't panic initially. You could have any number of things that would prevent you from calling at a specific time and keep your Mm. hands busy for a little bit, right? Just a diaper blowout would do it. And that's Mm. really common. But they called several times and they got no answer. So then they called the neighbors and the neighbors were like, you know, the, the lights are on. There was no power outage, no reason she wouldn't be answering the phone. They hadn't seen or heard anything unusual. So now the parents are concerned, and her father heads over to the Rasmussen home just to check on his daughter and make sure everything is okay, because it could be that maybe the infant she's watching might have gotten sick or is just taking up her time. It's also possible that maybe his own daughter has gotten sick or something's come up and she needs some help. He arrives at the Rasmussen house around 9.20 p.m., and he knocks on the door and rings the doorbell, and he finds the doors are locked. He can see the lights are on, but there's no answer, and he's knocking and banging on the door and calling her name. So he makes his way around the house, and he's sort of peering into windows as he goes. The Rasmussens had only been there for a few months. They'd only just moved in, and they didn't have any curtains hung up yet. They had, I think, blinds, but no curtains, which is the same situation I've been in. And I'm not judging because I've been in this house for seven years. So peeking through one window, he sees one of his daughter's shoes on the floor as well as her eyeglasses. And now he's really worried. So he makes his way around the house and around back, he sees a basement window. The screen had been popped out of the window frame and was propped up against the side of the house. So he was actually able to get through that window and into the basement. And once down there, he saw that there was a short step ladder that was near the the basement window. Apparently, the Rasmussens had been painting their basement, which is why the ladder was down there. And so he gets in through this window into this dark basement. He finds the lights. I assume the families knew each other and he'd been in the house before because of their social status, and that's how he found her as a babysitter. But I can't imagine how terrifying this all must have been for him. So in the basement, he sees his daughter's other shoe when the lights are on. And making his way upstairs, his worst fears are confirmed. The lights and the radio are on. Evelyn's books are scattered around the room. Furniture showed signs of there having been a struggle. He found his daughter's eyeglasses that she had just gotten that day, and they were broken on the living room floor along with her other shoe. And there is no sign of Evelyn. She is gone. And the baby? Thankfully, the baby was sound asleep and unharmed in her room. She hadn't yet been covered by the blanket, which is important timing wise. Richard Hartley runs to the neighbor's house and he's too distraught to dial the police himself and needs them to make the call for him. Okay, two things. First I have to ask just just to clarify. Mm-hmm. The doors were locked from the inside. Yes. Somebody got probably in through the basement, but also they probably got her out if they took her with them through the basement, right? That's why her shoe was there, which is Odd, right? It who, is. Who would lift a, a girl or... I mean, I don't know, was she was she conscious or not, but it's a weird way to get her out of the house, I think. It's very weird. They do mention in a couple of articles that the front door of the house was self-locking. So it was one of these where... Okay. We used to have a door like that at the cottage, the back door to the cottage. If you shut it, the latch would just engage. You know what I mean? The deadbolt automatically. Yeah. So... It might have been that style of house, but I very much doubt that they went out the front door with her because I just think somebody would have seen that, yeah. right? Plus the shoe. Plus, Plus the, the shoe, shoe yeah. exactly. She was obviously yeah. down there. I think it seems like there was a struggle in the living room and then she lost her second shoe, sort of. But we'll get a little bit more into that, yeah. Yeah, sorry. No, I that's okay. I didn't to go ahead. Just I wanted to make sure that I understood correctly. It's a really odd detail. Did the police find Anything helpful at all? They did. So other windows at the Rasmussen home had pry marks on them. In fact, other homes on the street also found marks around doors and windows. And there are mentions in articles of the time about a prowler or a burglar or possibly a peeping Tom in the area. If somebody Mm. had been breaking into homes for a while and no one started checking, though, until this disappearance, it's kind of hard to know for sure if they were... From that night, if they were related to that incident. Right, right. Because most of us don't check the windows for scratches regularly. 
Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But they found other things that definitely seem to connect to Evelyn's disappearance. They found footprints that were made by sneakers near the basement window where the screen had been removed, the one that people were going in and out of. And part of the reason the footprints were so evident was because the house was so new, they hadn't done the landscaping yet. So it was a lot of just dirt where they hadn't done like planting and grass and all that. So they had really good, clear footprints in the dirt. And then inside the house, there were similar footprints left in dirt in the carpet of the home, specifically in the living room. The shoes had like grooves in the sole. Do you know what I mean? Where it like picked up dirt and then dropped it in the... You see it a lot with snow here, right? Like if you're wearing a boot and you're, you walk into your house and you can see the perfect shoe prints yeah. of snow. Yeah. So it was like that, but with dirt. The more upsetting evidence, it seems that there were small drops of blood inside the house, but also two pools of blood outside the house. So one of them was outside near the basement window, and the other one is reported as being about 100 yards away near a neighbor's garage. And so on that same garage was also a bloody handprint about four feet or 122 centimeters up, and then a very, very large blood stain that was reported to be 18 inches in diameter, so like 46 centimeters. That's a large blood stain. It was. It seems like, based on where the handprint was and the blood stain, my best guess is that she was bleeding and whoever was carrying her or leading her sort of lay her down there for a little bit. Well, we'll talk about more of that later. But the handprint kind of indicates that maybe whoever had her, if it was their handprint, you know, they'd either been carrying or dragging her and sort of rested for a minute on the side of, do you know what I mean? How you might lean up against the side of yeah, the building yeah. to rest. Sure. Yeah. It would be the right height for that. It could also have been her own handprint because there was a, only a little blood in the house and more blood outside. I almost think that like maybe they had her go out the window of her own accord, and then she got punched, yeah. you know, or hit. Because if she had a head wound, if she was if she was punched and, you know, split an eyebrow or even a bloody nose, like, that can all really bleed a lot, a lot, a mm. lot. So maybe she'd been hit in the house, which maybe broke her glasses and gave her a little bloody nose, and then again when she was outside. It's hard to know, but it said that in a lot of the news coverage of the time that when her mom saw the blood stain. She said that she felt very sure that her daughter was no longer alive, which is really sad. Very sad. Yeah. Yeah. It's, again, it's that thought that it seems like it would make sense if, if she was bleeding and unconscious. It's like, did they put her down to rest for a minute before carrying her to the next place and then carrying her to the next place? We do know that tracking dogs traced her scent from the house across the the backyards to Cooley Drive, which is about two blocks away. And they believe that at that point, whoever had her put her into a car and drove away. This was all done before DNA testing, but they were able to confirm it was Evelyn's blood type, which was type A. And I made a big deal about all of this being homecoming at the beginning. And it wasn't just because I was going off on a random tangent. Now that we all know what homecoming is like in a place that has American football, one of the things that makes the case so tragic is that I think there were possibly witnesses who may have intervened had it been any other night. So for example, there was a witness that they called Mr. X in the newspapers. He was a block from the Rasmussen house picking up his brother-in-law to go to the homecoming game at around 7.15 that night. He reported seeing two men with a girl who seemed to be intoxicated, like they were all drunk and mm. sort of helping her to walk. And he just assumed that they were people that were enjoying a pregame party, you know? Sure, yeah. And they were about a block away from him, so... It's like he could make out that it was two men and a woman and how they were sort of moving, but he couldn't see anything in detail. And the neighborhood didn't have any streetlights yet. So he could kind of see that this was happening, but not super close. And there was no reason for him to worry about anything. It just seemed like, again, people that maybe partied a little too hard before the game. Then as he and his brother-in-law were driving to the game, just a few moments later, he was actually almost hit by a car speeding past, which he remembered as a two-tone green 1942 Buick. And in the car, the other thing that was odd was there were three people in the car. There was the man in the front driving, but then there was a man and a woman in the back seat. And the woman sort of looked like her head was slumped forward as though she were passed out. He thought it was probably the same people that he had seen previously. So that night he had just written it off. He just thought, 
you know, again, people partying too hard before the big game. But once he heard about Evelyn's disappearance, all of a sudden everything he'd seen took on a much more sinister sort of possibility, and so he contacted the police. He was known as Mr. X in the newspapers in order to protect his privacy at the time, but he was a local man by the name of Ed Hoffer. There were also people in the area who heard screams, but again, they thought it was younger people partying. I mean, that's such a reoccurring theme, right? Hearing screams, not knowing what they mean, or thinking they mean something else. Also this kind of, it's just not possible that it means something bad. You know what I mean? It's Yeah. Yeah. And you never want it to be anything bad. I joke all the time about hating the sound of children screaming, like playing, but I really do. Because migraines aside, I'm constantly on alert. It's always like, oh, they're having fun. No, wait, is someone hurt? That didn't sound fun. And then, yeah, you hear people every so often, you'll hear something and you're not sure what you heard. What are you going to call the police and say, I think I might have heard a scream somewhere near me? Like, that's not yeah. helpful. But I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks about this kind of stuff. A lot. <laughs> When we still lived in Vienna, we had new luxury condos built just right next to our garden. And a lot of families with children moved in there. And one of the, of the families had a little kid and she screamed like she was being murdered. I'm not even kidding. Seriously, yes. at first, we, so me and my neighbors, we kept running outside to see if she needed help because it sounded... It sounded like somebody was burning her with cigarettes or stabbing her in the eye. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but no. She just liked to scream like, yeah, that was that was her thing. And she also liked to do this the whole day during summer, like from yes. the morning until the evening. And so I constantly had to work with my doors and windows closed, which was so much fun. But last thing I heard is that she grew out of that face, luckily. That's so funny because we had at my old house, there was a little girl in the house sort of directly behind my yard. And the same thing, they moved in and all of a sudden I hear these screams, like I thought an animal had been caught in a trap and I went running to the back of the yard and it's, and I was like, are you okay? And she ran in because I scared her running toward her. But yeah, just a screamer, just love to scream, scream all day. And it's like, my nerves can't handle this. This is a lot of screaming. Yeah. Again, totally grew out of it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, scary. There were also reports of a light tan car scene circling the area, but I don't think anything ever came of that. The search they undertook was massive. It was one of the largest in Wisconsin history. I read a lot of old articles, contemporary articles, uh, to cover this case. Most, of course, are from the La Crosse Tribune. But I'm going to read you a tidy summary I found in an article that was marking the anniversary of the case. It's also from the Sunday Features in the La Crosse Tribune from October 22nd, 1978. The title of the article is Our Greatest Mystery, Evelyn Hartley Case Caused Turmoil 25 Years Ago, and it was written by Jerome R. Rosso. I'm going to read an excerpt from this article, and I've edited for content and clarity. Quote, Intense searches were made on foot by boat and from the air. College and high school students joined by, in the phrase of the time, an aroused citizenry, join hands to search large areas of ground. As many as 2,000 searchers were involved the first few days. At that time, the Rasmussen House was on the outskirts of the city, with considerable open ground nearby. The searches began there and covered an ever-widening area. Squirrel and deer hunters were asked to stay alert when they sought game in wooded areas, and farmers in the area were urged to search their own property for some sign of the missing girl, including any indication of freshly turned earth. National Guard, Civic Air Patrol, and Air Force pilots took to light planes and helicopters to look from the air for anything suspicious, while flotillas of boaters organized to search the network of waterways around the city. End quote. This was a really tremendous effort, but they did not find Evelyn. Okay, they did not find Evelyn, but did they find anything at all? They did. They found several things. So, just off of Highway 14 in the town of Shelby, not far from La Crosse, searchers found a pair of sneakers that are described as tennis shoes. They were a size 11, and authorities were able to deduce that the model of shoe was the Hood Mogul. Hood Mogul gotta love that. It was made by the Goodrich Company and available for purchase in Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, and Illinois. 
when inspecting the shoes, they were able to determine that two different people had worn the shoes and that they were much too small for one of the people who had worn them. They also found a very distinctive pattern on the sole of the shoe that indicated the person who wore the shoes frequently drove a whizzer motorbike, not motorcycle. Investigators tried hard to track down the owner of the bike, and because I know we've got a lot of motorcycle folk in our listening group, I wanted to give you just a little bit of information. For our motorcycle enthusiasts, this is from the Wizard website, and this shows how it went from being a small motor that you could attach to your bicycle to becoming a little bit more like a small motorcycle. So in 1949, that September, they say, quote, In order to keep pace with its new competition, Wizard released the Model 300 motor. This new engine had 7 8 inch valves, a more efficient combustion chamber, better cooling, and a higher compression ratio. These changes resulted in... Are you ready? A three-horsepower engine that could reach speeds of 40 miles an hour. Wizard sold about 15,000 Model 300 motors, $109.97 a piece. And then they go on to say that in 1951, Wizard released the Sportsman motorbike, which was much more like a real motorcycle. The Sportsman abandoned pedals altogether and used a Kickstarter to get the bike going. The Sportsman cost $224.50 for the standard edition, which had a clutch transmission, and $239.50 for the deluxe edition, which sported the Bimatic automatic transmission. So, there's some information on the Wizard. So they could see on the shoe that the guy was using a Kickstarter motorcycle. That's my impression, yes. Mm -hmm. And so they really investigated this. They were in touch with Wizard. They had their sales records. They were tracking down current and former Wizard bike owners, but nothing came of it. They never found anybody who uh, fit. Also, because forensics felt two people had worn the shoes, they felt that they had been way too small for one of the people who had worn them, which made me wonder if maybe the person who had the bike outgrew them. Like, would a teenager have had a this kind of thing for a bike, I wonder, at the time? And maybe they, they outgrew them? Would a teenager have a $224 motorcycle at that time? I mean, it depends on the teenager, right? And their parents? True. I assume that lacrosse would be like anywhere else, where there would be a very wealthy element somewhere nearby. But it's the only thing that made sense to me about why somebody would wear shoes that were much too small for them. That's the only thing that made sense to me, was that a teenager wore shoes, outgrew them really fast, you know what I mean, which is why they were wearing shoes and, they, and that they had the motorbike. And then maybe the shoes went to a charity shop, because otherwise... I mean, it could also be the other way around, though. Like a teenager outgrew shoes, mm -hmm. then they went to the cha charity shop and somebody got them who had the motorbike. Maybe. I wonder what the cost of the motorbike was comparatively. Like, would somebody who could afford that buy tennis shoes in a charity shop? I don't know. It could absolutely be. There's lots of little things like that that don't make sense. It's like, there's this, yeah. but then there's that. I mean, it's all possible, right? Yeah. So they found shoes. And did the impressions match the shoes? Yes, exactly. Okay. They did. Yeah. Um, and they were the correct size as well for the prints. So they really do believe those are the shoes. And even more damning is that on the shoes were bloodstains, obvious bloodstains, and they were type A, Evelyn's blood type. The shoes, I think, are still believed to be the best evidence, the most concrete evidence. Also found near the bloody shoes was a blue denim jacket. It was a very faded blue. So Everyone can imagine, right? Denim that's been washed over and over. You pay extra now to get it to look that way when it's new. But this one had gotten that way, honestly. It was a well-worn, mended jacket. It was a medium size, and they estimated it to be about a 36-inch chest with buttons down the front, uh, four buttons. The third one down was missing. And one of the more interesting things about the jacket is it looks like it was intentionally cropped. So, like, made shorter and then seamed up at the bottom using white thread. I don't know why somebody would do that unless maybe it was torn or previously something had stained it, maybe covering other blood, who can say. There were metallic paint flecks on it, but more concerning was the blood stains on the jacket, which were also confirmed to be Evelyn's blood type. 
I've mentioned Evelyn was type A blood, and I looked this up, and from the most to least common blood types, it goes O, A, B, A, B. Having type A blood, she did have the second most common blood type, which is also not going to make the investigation easier, right? Right. Inside the pocket of the jacket, they found fibers that are used in scrubbing brushes. Another clue on the jacket, probably the biggest, is indicating a possible profession. What they had was this really interesting wear pattern on the coat. All around the chest of the jacket, underneath the armpits, was a circular wear pattern as though the person had the jacket on and then had a harness that went around their chest under their arms over the jacket. This led the police to wonder if the jacket belonged to a steeplejack. And I had to look this up because it's not a term that's still used commonly today. Do you know what it means? I just wanted to ask, yeah. I mean, you can kind of guess what it means by the two words, but yeah, it's basically somebody who works on church steeples or other very high structures. So building, cleaning, painting, maintaining really tall structures. Mm. Lighthouses. Yes, lighthouses. Exactly. Anything very tall. And so... The type of uh, harness that they would wear for safety would match up with the sort of marks found on this jacket. And police sort of went out into the community and they investigated and spoke to all of the local steeplejacks, everyone working sort of adjacent to that profession in the construction trade, and they just got nowhere. The shoes and jacket were actually put on display all over the area, county fairs, that sort of thing. Like, they traveled around asking the public for help to see if anyone recognized them, but they never generated a lead. Also found a few days after Evelyn's disappearance were a bloodstained bra and woman's underpants. They were found on Highway 14, about two miles south of La Crosse, and a pair of men's trousers that also seemed to have bloodstains on them were found another four miles down that same highway. Evelyn's mother said that the underwear was similar to the bra and underwear that her daughter wore, but that she couldn't be certain that they belonged to her daughter. And as far as I'm aware, the blood on the underwear and the men's trousers weren't tested. If they were, again... All it would have told us was the blood type, and I'm not sure it's that helpful. It would have, if she were AB or something, it might have been a little bit more useful. Yeah. I mean, that's all they had. What could it they is, do? of course. I think yeah. they did everything they could at the time. Absolutely. It's amazing. It Well. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Just, just wait. This is just the beginning. It gets... This is wild. So the town is terrified. Everyone without curtains is putting them up. There is a 10 p.m. curfew for all teenagers, which... Didn't they all have to be home by 10 o'clock anyway? And, of course, nobody's going to babysit. The next thing that happened was the largest mass undertaking of lie detector tests that I've ever encountered. I have an article to read you. Again, you know how I love to come at you with these old articles. So this is from the La Crosse Tribune, May 6th, 1954, page one. And the title of the article is Lie Detector Tests Started Here Thursday. Quote, are you withholding any information regarding the Evelyn Hartley disappearance case? This question was answered truthfully by a central high school youth Thursday morning as authorities started mass lie detector tests in an effort to force a break in the babysitter abduction mystery. Most pertinent question asked concerned withholding of information on the Hartley case. The last question asked of the students was, have you answered all of these questions truthfully? Under the proposed plan, only male students and teachers in the city's schools and La Crosse State College will be asked to take the tests. Some 1,750 students and teachers are expected to be questioned before the plan is concluded. Josephson, he was the investigator, has high hopes that the interrogation will turn up valuable information that may lead to solving the mystery which has baffled criminologists throughout the nation. More than 2,000 persons have been questioned in interrogations directed by police. Authorities believe the abductors have been living with the crime these past six months and may crack under pressure of the investigation. It is also believed the men sought are local residents and are still in this area. End quote. Okay, so those are excerpts from this article about the lie detector tests. It's hard to imagine 
that happening today, like over 2,000 people on a lie detector test. But I mean, of course, nowadays you have the possibility to do mass DNA tests. Of course, so, yeah. But th- what else could they have done? I mean, it's incredible the work they did. It Honestly, is. they tried everything, I think. They really did. And it, the other thing that's amazing, there were only about 300 people interviewed with a lie detector, which was at that time state-of-the-art technology. I mean, that was. Mm. What we know now, it seems like a big waste of taxpayer money. But at the time, it's remarkable that they even started to organize it. You know what I mean? And it really does seem like everybody was happy to do it. Like everybody was on board with this. And another thing that they did was gas stations had these big rectangular stickers that said, my car is okay, like exclamation points. Essentially, what would happen is if you went to a gas station for any reason, they would ask, everyone kind of knew this was happening. And so you could volunteer, everybody did apparently, to have their car looked at. The gas station attendant would give the car a thorough check over. And if they found no I don't know, just obvious blood stains or other problematic evidence. Then they gave you this sticker that you could display on your windshield, letting everyone know that your car was okay. No blood in this car. I'm okay. And I did actually read in a couple of other places that the gas station attendants were actually instructed in reality. So that's what everyone was told at the time. But like in reality, what they did was everybody got the My Car is Okay sticker, regardless of how much blood they found in a car. But that if they saw anything that looked a little bit suspicious, they would just make a note of the make, model, and plate of the car and immediately phone the police, which makes perfect sense because that way you're not spooking anybody right it's like yeah you're good probably everybody thought nobody was even checking but maybe they maybe they really were they just didn't find any cars soaked in blood it's brilliant i love that i think that's amazing my car is okay wow (laughs) no dead bodies in my trunk they didn't find any blood soaked cars but did they have any suspects at all they must have right well evelyn's father was He was absolutely devastated. And remember, her family had already lost one child, so they've now lost a second child. This is so hard to imagine this sort of loss. And so he's devastated, but he immediately volunteered to take a lie detector to do the polygraph so that he could be definitively ruled out, which he was. The other suspect that we need to talk about, some of you, I'm sure some of our listeners are like, La Crosse, Wisconsin. That's right. It's time to talk about Edward Gein. So Ed Gein was born in La Crosse County, Wisconsin, and he lived in that same area. But his family moved away from the area when he was seven years old. Ed's mother was abusive, hyper-religious, and taught her sons that sex was only for marriage and that all women were filthy, dirty whores. That's, you know, mommy's words, not mine. This was problematic for a lot of reasons. A little bit. Just listen, there were some issues. And Ed Gein is really, I think, an episode for another time. If we ever do decide to cover him, I feel like everyone knows all about him and nobody needs us to tell them. But he was the inspiration for a lot of horror movies and their characters. Yeah, Norman Bates in Psycho, Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs, Texas Chainsaw Massacre... So many. If there's a skin suit or just real mommy (laughs) issues in a horror movie, it's based on Ed Gein. He was arrested in 1957. And when his crimes came to light, a lot of people wondered if he might have been responsible for the disappearance of Evelyn and also of another missing young lady from the area who will be a case for another day. Uh, I don't know. This seems like a very different MO, though. Mm -hmm. Ed was a grave robber. I know he's you know, always considered to be one of the big ones, but he actually just had two known victims. Both of the women he killed were strong, independent women, you know, just the kind of women his mommy told him to hate. Yep, exactly. I don't see any way that Evelyn would have fit his profile. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense, right? And it's funny too, because Ed is often, he's often referred to as one of America's most notorious serial killers or... You know, he's always referred to as a serial killer, but he wasn't one. He may have become one. Just like Manson. Yes, exactly. 
Manson was definitely not one. Ed Gein may have become one because he really made no effort to hide his crimes and he was really very mentally ill. I mean, I think had the police not found this, you know, tracked him down immediately because he was the yeah. last person seen with somebody who had gone missing, but he wasn't sneaking around much and hiding things. You know, I think no. if, if no one had caught him, he would have had another victim, but he he was really very mentally ill, and the police cleared him of any involvement in Evelyn's disappearance, and I don't think he had anything to do with it. I think people just get excited that there's somebody, mm. this really notorious necrophile who, yeah. you know, it's exciting, but it's just not. Did they, by any chance, ask Henry Lee Lucas as well? You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> But I'm sure he would have confessed to it. He w he definitely would have confessed to it. <laughs> I think it's a little bit early for Henry Lucas. I was going to say, though. I think the timing is a little off. Yeah, 10 years. Yeah, there are some people who, no matter, it's like, was it Ted Bundy? No, he wasn't born yet. It wasn't <laughs> Ted Bundy. Yeah. So any any other suspects, non non serial killer related? No. Or non notorious? Nope, sadly not. Mm. And I know there were people that were taken in for questioning, people who were arrested on um, suspicion and released. I'm not going to get into those people because, well, they were cleared and so there's really no point. Yeah. But let's walk through what we think maybe likely happened. So things that we know, this was a new housing development, street lights weren't installed yet. Also, Evelyn went missing just after the baby went to bed. Because you remember the baby hadn't been covered with the blanket yet. If the baby was supposed to be put to bed at 7 and then covered with a blanket at 7.15, that's a really short window of when she might have been taken, right? Because the baby was in the bed, but not yet covered. So here's what I wonder. Because the parents left at 6.45, she only had an awake baby for 15 minutes, right? I assume she, like, rocked her and read to her and then just put her down. I'm actually, th that's what I've read is that the parents left at 6.45, but I almost wonder if the baby wasn't already sleeping because that just seems weird to me. Like, it's not easy to get a kid down at that age, so I would have thought any, it doesn't matter, really, one way or another. But she didn't have time to put the baby blanket on, and she had only been there for a half hour before that was supposed to happen. So no. it wasn't a lot of time. So I just wonder, was there somebody having no luck in other houses? Maybe they had tried other houses. Maybe that's why there were pry marks. Maybe a barking dog or a light turning on. Because it was homecoming night, maybe whoever this was thought most people would not be home. And sure enough, they watched the Rasmussen car pull out of the driveway. At the time, I think the car, the house now has a enclosed garage, but at the time, the driveway was sort of on the left side. And as you pulled up, it was like the house and then a lovely screened porch on the left side, but no garage. So when that car pulled out, that was the only car. Maybe they thought the whole family had left for the game. And so they broke in through that basement window and then were surprised by Evelyn? Or was she targeted? Was somebody watching? Had somebody been specifically watching her through the living room window with no curtains? Or, in that vein, was then the regular babysitter, their normal, usual babysitter, the target? Was somebody stalking her and then Evelyn was an accidental victim? These are all sort of questions that you see over and over again and things people wonder about and things I've been wondering since I first heard about it. Nothing was stolen from the house and the baby was unharmed and untouched, so... Was it an interrupted robbery turned kidnapping and murder? Did she recognize the people or person? And that's why here they took her. And then now, see, we're circling back to what you were asking in the initial early aspects of the case when I was telling you about the basement window, right? Because maybe it was two people. If she was unconscious, did somebody pass her up through the window? Do you know what I mean? Was it like... Because you would have needed two people to get yeah. her out a window if they had knocked her out inside. It's difficult with an unconscious body. Through it's a so window. difficult. I think it's very difficult. It, very difficult, yeah. And so that's one of the questions, too, is, you know, were there two people? Does that explain why there were bloody clothes found that didn't seem like they would fit the same person? Like, the shoes mm. seemed like they'd be much too big for whoever was wearing the jacket. They were found really close to each other, the shoes and the jacket, which is why I think they thought they must be connected. So it was maybe one of them carrying her while the other went for the car. But then again, that doesn't explain the sightings of a girl with two men, if that was even Evelyn. We just, there are so many questions we just don't have answers to. It's hard. 
It's really hard. Evelyn's parents, uh, especially her father, they spoke publicly, issuing a number of appeals for information on his missing daughter. Unfortunately, the family were flooded with information, and most of it was from... What's the nice way to say this? It was either from mentally ill but well-intentioned people, or more frequently, probably malicious people, people looking for spotlight. So they got a lot of letters saying... Evelyn ran off with a guy. She's fine. I know where she is. She's going to come back when all of this dies down. That kind of stuff. Nothing they received was helpful. Nothing they received was believed to be true. I think all of it was incredibly painful for the family. So there are Mm. places where if you look this up, you can find out all the information. But I don't want to, like, republicize crummy stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's always the same in those cases. I don't, I hate that part, really. Right. It's bad enough that you get, yeah, because you get a lot of like, I had a dream and, you know, people are checking out literally everything. And sometimes you're also going to get a lot of well-intentioned stuff that just doesn't pan out. So you're already getting flooded with information and people, it's the people who maliciously, you know, for, for fame or is it prank? Because I think it'll be funny if they're if their letters read on the news, you know, and it's awful. This is also a case where both families, you know, both the Hartley family, obviously, and the Rasmussen family, they were never the same again after this. Their lives were profoundly changed in terrible ways because of what happened to Evelyn. And there are still surviving family members, and so I'm not going to get into the level of, sometimes I get deeper into personal information, but in this case, I just want to respect their privacy. I know that her parents, especially later on in life, there would be requests later on for interviews, you know, on these anniversaries and things, and they would often say, we've said everything we have to say. Like, there's nothing else to say. The one thing I did get a little bit of a surprise from when I was doing the research is, so Evelyn had two older brothers, and her brother Richard, you know, passed away from polio when he was in the Navy. Her other brother survived. Uh, He passed away recently, last five years, I believe. His name was Thomas, and he was actually a botanist, and we worked at the same place. So we both worked at the Arnold Arboretum. He worked there decades before I did, but he was a really remarkable man. He was a botanist who specialized in the Rue family or citrus plants and spent most of his adult life in Australia, where he considered his life's work. And I believe Evelyn's younger sister is still alive. I wish both families that were involved just... I wish them well. I wish for answers, because you never know. In 2004, a man came forward. He had been in a bar and was planning to record the band that was performing that night at the bar. And I think it must have been quite a while later that he actually listened to the tape. And when he was listening to it, he realized he had recorded a conversation between two men, and one of them was claiming responsibility for Evelyn's murder, saying she had been killed and then buried in Lafarge, Wisconsin, after she had been kidnapped. Part of the difficulty with this information is that by the time this information got to the police, the major players involved, the two men that were talking at the bar, were both dead. How did they know that? Did they have the name of the guys on the tape? He knew. The man who had recorded it, I believe, knew exactly whose conversation Mm -hmm. he had picked up. It was like a place he went to regularly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's what it was, but whoever had the tape definitely knew the people talking on the tape. I assumed that he didn't come forward until after they were dead because he didn't find the tape until then, but it could be that he waited. I'm not sure, to be honest, on that case. I didn't look too much into it, only because the major players are both deceased, and the place where she was alleged to have been buried was, I guess, along a river. So even if she had been buried there, the odds are her body would have long since washed away. There was a mention in an article about possibly looking in the area with uh, cadaver dogs. Again, I didn't get that into this aspect of things. It's kind of a footnote on the case. It's sort of the most recent activity. It is still an active investigation. So for all we know, there could be things happening that we just don't know about, that the police are still keeping close to their chest, close to the vest. But that's all there is. And without DNA, the evidence they do have is sort of difficult. Apart from the sneakers, you know, finding clothes with blood in them on the side of the road could be as simple as a bloody nose and littering, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially anything like that where, 
I don't know, I could see somebody having a bloody nose and like grabbing something out of a bag to staunch a bloody nose and then just like flinging it out a window. Although I don't think anyone staunches a nose with shoes. But the underwear, I I don't know. It's upsetting and it's sad. And it makes me sad that they never had any answers. And an article, again, from the La Crosse Tribune by Emily. Her last name is P-Y-R-E-K. Pirek? Pyrek, maybe. So Emily Pyrek, P-Y-R-E-K. The name of this article is Rosalind Rasmussen Recalls Childhood Terror on 64th Anniversary of Evelyn Hartley's Disappearance. Rosalind is the older child who went to the game with her parents that night while her younger sister stayed home. This is a quote from that article. Quote, I think the case would be really hard to solve at this time. I feel like anyone who was involved in anything is long past. It would have provided more closure if the person had been found. Even to have a body to bury, for someone to be prosecuted, would have helped our families move on. While her life and that of her family was forever changed by the tragedy, she also counts her blessings. If I hadn't gone to that game, I might not be alive either. I kind of feel now like Evelyn is kind of an angel. What a martyr she was. She gave up her life to protect my baby sister. End quote. Evelyn was last seen wearing red denim, white stag jeans, a size 34 to 36 plain white ship and shore blouse with pearl buttons, a beaded belt with a metal buckle, size 24, and white bobby socks. If you have any information concerning this case, please contact the La Crosse Police Department at 608 785 59 Six two, And that's it. That is the tragic disappearance and, I think, murder of Evelyn Hartley. Yeah, probably. I'm wowed by what the police did. It's it's almost as um, with the Lucy Berlin case. I like these cases where you can really see how much the investigators work to get it solved. They really Unfortunately, did. Unfortunately, this time, they didn't. They couldn't. Yeah. I know, interestingly, the Lindbergh law came up because I think in the early stages of the investigation, the FBI offered to get involved um, as part of the Lindbergh law, but the local police really handled it. They really did have it well in hand. I can't think of anything they got wrong. It would have been a very different situation had it happened today with Amber Alerts, DNA, Mm. You know, everything that we have. I think also maybe a slight more willingness to be rude. If that makes sense, like, where in 1953, I think maybe it would be more common if you saw a girl with with two boys and she looked like she was drunk. Yeah, sure. It's different nowadays. Exactly. I think that's what I, yeah, I think more people would, just a different time. We have, it's a different time and we have different tools at our disposal. But yeah, I think law enforcement did everything. They had special investigators. Everybody was deeply involved in this case. I don't know. It's just one I think about, and I'm going to share more articles, and we'll talk about in the Facebook group some more, because there's other ancillary information that I didn't get into a lot of the nitty bits and pieces, because it's, unless you're sitting looking at maps and things, it doesn't translate well to a podcast. So I'm looking forward to talking to you all about this in the Facebook group. All right. Do you have anything good this week? Yeah, I did something good today. I went shopping with my sister. We had a nice little afternoon at the mall, buying some clothes and, you know, some home decor stuff. It was nice. We both needed it. Oh, a yeah. Lot. That's awesome. I love that. How about you? Um, yeah, I have a, a movie that takes place in Wisconsin that I want to recommend. I think, have I, I probably have already recommended Drop Dead Gorgeous. Mm-hmm. I have. Okay. All right. So that's one thing. What else? We finally watched the people versus my brain. This is the this is the end of the podcast where it's like I've lost my tongue doesn't work anymore. <laughs> uh, the people versus OG Simpson. We finally watched that and it was excellent. And you and my sister both told me that season two is even better about the Versace murder. So yeah, I'm looking forward to watching that. Yeah. And what else? We are in the podcast awards and so if you go to podcastawards.com then you can vote on our little podcast we are absolute underdogs but you will find us in the true crime category the female hosted category and people's choice we are automatically entered into so if you enjoy our show and maybe you 
can't support us through Patreon, but you recommend us to your friends or you recommend us in other true crime forums if people are interested in finding a new podcast. This is one other hopefully small thing that you can do to really help out the show and we would very much appreciate it. Yes, really would help us out a lot. Uh, what also would help us out would be if you have three minutes, if you like our podcast, to go to iTunes and leave us a rating and or review because that's also a way you can help us next to sharing our content with your friends who you would think would also enjoy Murder Mystery and the Macabre. Also, come join our Facebook group. It's a fun little lovely group of people with all kinds of content. A friend told me Annie and I managed to create the most random group on the internet, and I'm very proud of that, because that's us. It really <laughs> is. random. I know. I have so <laughs> many friends who, I swear, some of them don't even, they really are very picky about the podcast, because they don't actually like true crime. They like our historical episodes more, um, but they just love the Facebook group so much. <laughs> and that's... It's nice. It really is such a nice, nice, interesting group of people. If you want more information on our Patreon, please go either to patreon.com or to our webpage freshelpodcast.com. We have three tiers. We do monthly game nights, uh, makeup video fails, things like this. It's also it's as random as our Facebook group, but a lot of fun, I think. It's very random. On our webpage, you find all the ways to contact us, our email, our PO box, um, links to our merch store, to our Patreon, to our Facebook group, to our Instagram. Yes. And also, please tell your dogs, your pets, your cats, all of them that we said hi, that we love them, that we miss them. We want you to cuddle them and hold them tightly. And please be kind to your other fellow human beings and give them sometimes the benefit of the doubt. Please. Please. Absolutely. And if you are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.